good morning and welcome to Bible study today uh, for St. Peter Lutheran Church in Schaumburg, Illinois. We are closing out our series on Philippians. Uh, today we're looking at specifically the fourth chapter, verses 2 through 23. And uh, it is a good opportunity to um, really close out today. Paul has some uh, amazing, um, oh, how shall we say it, uh, great ideas, not only for them then, but for us today. And so uh, the things that we're looking at closing out today is, is Christian unity, uh, the joy in the Lord, uh, the gentleness towards others, following uh, his example, and of course, the secret of being content in all circumstances. And we're going to talk about that, obviously, a little bit later here in the Bible study. So again, hopefully you have your Bibles ready. Uh, again, it is Philippians chapter 4 and uh, verses 2 through 23. And let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time today. We thank you that uh, you allow us to meet like this. And Father, we thank you that uh, your word goes forth um, anytime in any way, that um, uh, the power, Lord, of your word uh, is just amazing, that it changes lives and that it transforms us by the power of Jesus Christ and uh, you working, of course, through your Holy Spirit. So continue to bless us this day as we study, as we learn, and as we grow. We love you and we thank you already, Lord, for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and get to it then. Um, our first section here, there's Philippians 4, 2 to 3. I'm going to, I of course have it for you on the screen up there, but I'm going to read also here out of my Bible, but uh, this is from our uh, ESV. And um, we see here that it says, uh, Paul says, I entreat Eudodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So already there, um, it's interesting as we start out today, uh, look at what's taking place. There are apparently two women that are uh, in the church and they've got a situation that's going on. They're, they're having a disagreement. And uh, if you notice, I have some questions here on the screen for you. At any time, you can stop and, and think about those things before we go to the answer. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you to pause at one time, but take a look at this. Paul asked these two women to uh, settle their issue. Well, how did he actually how did he actually proceed with it? How did he say to do this? What, what was the way that they were supposed to do it? If you want to pause, that's fine. If not, I'm going to go on to the next one too. Uh, what motivation then is given for doing this kind of thing? Now, at this time, you want to pause for sure, answer those two questions, and then come back. And welcome back. Uh, so here he's entreating you, Dodi. In other words, he's asking them. He's, he's wanting them to find peace with one another. Um, and how does he do it? He wants them to agree in the Lord. They are to seek out reconciliation. They are to seek out those things that they're already in the church. They are working with Paul. They're working with one another. Um, but what, what's really cool about this is that um, the answer is given in, in gospel motivation. I mean, look at this. They've helped alongside. They've, they've done this in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers. And what is the reason? That their names are already written in the book of life. Not only the, the women, but then also the other workers too. In other words, you might have disagreements. There might be things that you don't get along with with one another, but the reality when it comes down to it, we're all on the same team. We're on the same side. And that's so good to hear because these two women obviously had disagreement. It was public. It was made known somehow that, that Paul needed to write this to the entire congregation. And he's wanting them to be reconciled. He's wanting them to be at peace with one another, even if they disagree. And this is the thing, is that they're supposed to agree in the Lord. In other words, um, finding out what is true, what is right, and then being able to, you know, maybe even put away those differences. But to find the truth, to find, again, um, the idea that we, are, we have it hard enough with Satan and what he's trying to do against us. Uh, let us come together in the Lord. And he's encouraging people to do that. So uh, it's a good motivation, not only for them, but for us as well. 
us as well. Excuse me. <laughs> All right. So let's go on then to the next part. Philippians 4, verse 4. There's only one, one chapter. Why would this be? Hmm, let's read this. What's it say? Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Is that all of it? No, I think there's something else. Oh, again, I will say rejoice. Well, we should. A double rejoice, right? <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So let's think about that. I know I'm being a little facetious here, but, but rejoicing in the Lord. When should we do it? Is it only sometimes? Is it maybe when we feel like it? No, it's not what it says. Hmm. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The idea that we are to be in joy because of what God has done for us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Good times, that's easy. Mediocre times, a eh, little more difficult. Hard times, can we rejoice? You know what? I'm going to tell you right here now. You, you're only human. You're only human if you have said before, oh, Lord, where are you? Especially in times of need. That is common. That is really the way things are in our human sinful nature. We don't always see the good. We doubt at times. We wonder at times when things don't go our way. But Paul reminds us to rejoice. Rejoice because of, the, of what the Lord has done overall. He's given us Jesus as our Savior, and therefore, no matter what happens to us, we can rejoice because God's got this. God has this. And I know that we don't always feel like he does, but he does. And the reality is that Paul is just reminding us we can get down on ourselves. We don't have the joy. It gets sapped from us. It gets taken from us, uh, robbed from us. Uh, whatever word you want to say, but but this is what takes place, is that even in this little teeny tiny short verse, he's saying rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Emphasis his and mine and everyone else's, okay? Now, let's go on the next one. See some pictures over there. Philippians 4, uh, is that 2 to 3? No, I think, whoops, wrong 2 to 3, sorry about that. Uh, it's actually then um, 5 and following, 5 to 7. It says, and I'll put it up on the screen for you, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So again, I just put some pictures over there to start to help us to understand what's taking place. So starting up at the top upper left-hand corner, um, what are we to do as we live out our lives? In other words, how should we conduct ourselves? Well, we start with verse five. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. So the picture that I chose up there, um, and it goes with the other part two of five, the Lord is at hand. Reasonableness, another name for that is gentleness. Let your gentleness or your, your kindness, in other words, let those things that would show, um, you know, someone would want to actually listen to you to talk, <laughs> that they would want to hear from you because of the way that you respond, the way that you have your actions. Let that be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And I showed the picture of the hand there because it's just, it's a great picture of someone just being gentle and leading a, a little one there. Um, but the Lord is at hand. He's with us. He's always there by our side, no matter what the situation. And we don't, or maybe sometimes we, we have the tendency to think, oh gosh, well, if God is at, at my side, then, then nothing's going to happen bad to me. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. In fact, when storms come, God holds us even tighter. Um, you know, the whole footprints in the sand thing, right? You see the one set of footprints, and it's because God is carrying us. That's a great picture of what's really taking place. Paul is saying, let your reasonableness, your gentleness, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Then we've got the next picture. Wait a second. That doesn't look right. Do not be anxious about anything. That woman still looks anxious, doesn't she? Oh, wait, hold on. I think I can fix this. Let me see here. Uh, let's try this. Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. Don't mock me. Don't mock me. That is a classic, awesome move there. Look at that. 
do not be anxious about anything. What? What? Come on. I got to be anxious about something. I have to worry about something, right? That, that's kind of who I am. That's how my life is. I've got to be anxious, right? No, you don't. <laughs> do not be anxious about anything. Not some things, not little things, not, oh, well, that big one. That one I can be anxious about. No, 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 no. Paul is saying, do not be anxious about anything. And here's why. Here's what you're supposed to do. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay? Let your requests be made known to God. God already knows what's going on in your life. Am I, am I right? I mean, that's what scripture tells us. He is omniscient. He's uh, omnipresent. I mean, he's got all these things going on that makes him God. He knows everything. He's everywhere. He knows all things. I mean, that's what makes him almighty God. That's who I would want as a God too, right? He knows how to do everything. But this is what Paul says. Don't be anxious. In other words, don't worry about those things. In everything by prayer and supplication, everything in our being, we go to the one who already knows what's going on, who holds us in his hand with thanksgiving. Go with supplication, thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Oh God, please, you know what's going on. My job is questionable. I'm looking for work. I'm you know, in need of this or that. Fine. Transportation. Yes, that's needing it's it's on its last leg it's it's got four tires but only three are working you know those types of things and then family family relationships oh lord what are we supposed to do how are we supposed to do this god knows he has the answers and he's going to walk you through it and he's going to be with you and here's the best thing here's the best thing look at verse 7 the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I want to pause real quick if you haven't already answered it, but go ahead and obviously look at the pictures there, but go ahead and pause right now and make sure those questions are answered, especially what gift is given if we do these things. And welcome back. What gift is given if we do these things? Verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Many times you have heard this, by the way. You might say, wow, that's one of my you know, favorite verses, or, or man, that seems like a very familiar verse. Oftentimes, pastors use this in the close of their messages. It is a <laughs> blessing. It is a benefit, if you will, from hearing what has taken place as you've listened to the sermon, as you've listened to the message. Closing out that time, the peace of God, which surpasses, or sometimes even they'll say passes, all understanding. Guard our hearts and our minds, or keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. That is what we long for, isn't it? We know this world brings trouble, and yet we're looking for peace. And, and who is the one who actually gives peace? It's not some man-made religion. It's not some thing that we will find in this world. It only comes from God, our Heavenly Father, through His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, the one true God. This is what takes place. God does this, and Paul is simply reminding the people at Philippi, this is what's supposed to take place. So let's go on. How about Philippians 4, 8? Now again, this is another big one. Here we go. I'm just going to read it right off my screen here. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And I put my little uh, question mark guy there, and I want you to pause right now. And this one might take some time. Um, I want you to go ahead and look at that on the screen. Pause it right there, or look in your Bibles, obviously, because you have it right by you, hopefully. But Philippians 4, 8, I want you to actually think about things. And, and I'm, here's the deal. I'm not even going to give you an answer because I want you to think about those things that he's saying to think about. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, all those things. Think about what those things are. 
and I have something that I'm going to ask you once you come back. So I'm not going to give you any hint right now. Go ahead and, and push pause. And when you come back, I'll ask you a few more questions. Go ahead and push pause now. And welcome back. So <laughs> what did you come up with? Did you come up with those things that you, you know, true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellence, worthy of praise? Did you come up with people as those ideas? Did you come up with other scriptures? Did you come up with something else in the world? I mean, what is it that you came up with? See, I'm wondering the challenge today. Are all those things simply just about Jesus? Is it something that obviously he fits all of those things? He fits every single one of them and he fits them perfectly. Or is Paul talking about those things that still are in the world? Are those things, for instance, whatever is lovely, is it the idea of um, maybe your, your spouse or a significant other that, that you love? Uh, what about someone who is commendable or something that is commendable? What about something that has excellence? What if you know that there is something out there that shows excellence to you? Is that what you, is that what you thought about? Whatever the case may be, I know for sure when you get back down to that one part, if there's anything worthy of praise, I know for a fact the one who is worthy of praise is God and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God. And the reality is that he always has our praise. He's always the one who receives it and should receive it. So whatever the case may be that you thought about today, think about those things as we continue to see how God is so good to us. All right, let's keep going. Philippians 4, 10 to 13. I'm going to throw back in there 9 also as well. Um, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So again, Paul is saying, do these things. This is what will take place. So 10 to 13, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So, wow. <laughs> Paul is saying a huge, huge amount here. And, and you might have to take some time on this one as well. Um, he's telling the, the people again that he rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Uh, and now at length, he's received your concern for me. He knows what's taking place. He says to the Philippians, and he, he commends them. He says, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. And here we go. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I'm going to say that again. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now, the questions down below, um, you can, I'll ask them now, but then we're going to talk more about it. Uh, the first one, our contentment doesn't rely on earthly possessions. Or does it? There's your first one. The second one, are you content? Now, I want you to make sure that you do come back after you answer these, okay? So let's go ahead and push pause now, and um, I will come back and we'll talk about more, okay? Go ahead and push pause. And welcome back. So I'm glad that you did come back. Uh, I'm seeing on the screen there too, and I hope that you can see this very clearly. Um, I highlighted the word in uh, verse 11, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, I hope that you answered correctly or hopefully the best way. Um, our contentment doesn't rely on earthly possessions. I hope that you answered no. I really don't because if all you have to do is listen to this one phrase, um, you know, when's the last time you had to replace something? You know, uh, things don't last on this earth. And they're here today, gone tomorrow. 
things are built today to be thrown away. Um, we try to hold on to things, and yet if we continue to be around long enough, it would, whatever, deteriorate, disappear, break, whatever the case may be. But for Paul, he, he says in there, I'm, not that I'm speaking in, of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. It's so important today that you understand contentment is a learned uh, attribute. It's a learned attitude. It's a learned, really, philosophy. I don't know. You can add anything into it. But the reality is that it is a learned situation because of whatever situation that you're in. Um, to figure out how to be happy with the things that you have, to be joyful, to know that people out there who have a lot, if you ask them, a lot of times it's never enough. They're still not happy. They can have the biggest house. They can have the nicest car. They can have all the different things in this world, but it cannot be necessarily enough. So it's something to think about today. And as far as that one goes about, are you content? You know what? That is one of those questions that you might struggle with today. And I'm going to say, it's okay. When you recognize that you are having trouble being content, it's a great time to reflect on to see what God says. Well, God, what is it? You know, I, I want this new thing. I want this latest, greatest phone. I want this new car. I want this new boat. I want this new house or summer home or whatever, whatever the case may be. Struggling with that contentment, it is a learned thing and it's a place and an area that God is bringing you to grow in. And it's okay. So again, thank him for that because again, look what Paul says. He knows how to be brought low. He knows how to abound. He knows in every circumstance. He learned, he's learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. Now, some people continue to ask, well, what is that secret? What is that? What, what secret is he talking about? Verse 13, I believe, already answers right then and there. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Well, let's face it. It's got to be God because there isn't any other way that you can explain it. How can you understand that, you know, you, you know especially if you're, this is, um, again, being done by uh, our people here at St. Peter. We live in America. We've got a pretty good. We really do. But around the world, if you've ever been to certain places um, where you're scrapping by just every day, you're wondering what your next meal will be, or maybe your only meal for the day, or those types of things. Um, wow. The secret of being content, of being okay with what's going on. The idea is that we need to look to God for those things and those answers. All right? Let's continue on. Philippians 4, 14 to 20. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you, Philippians, you yourselves, know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Whew. <laughs> Lots of good stuff in here. So here are some questions for you to ponder. What value did Paul receive in the gifts given by the Philippians? And the second question. How does God reward their generosity? I want you to go ahead and put pause on there, or place pause now on there. Uh, go ahead and take a look back in these scripture lessons, whether it's on the screen or in your Bible. And then when you're done, come on back and hit play again. And welcome back. So lots of stuff here, right? Lots of great information. Um, the Philippians, they were generous people. They wanted to see the gospel spread. They wanted to see the gospel given, shared, taken all over the place. And he says in there that he's calling out people. He's saying, well, here we are. At the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership. No one would support him. No one would help him except you only. 
Even at Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So there's really your first answer here coming up. What value did Paul receive in the gifts given by the Philippians? It wasn't that he was seeking out the gifts, but that because the fruit was grown in the people, guess what? When you are a giving person, as God has freely given of his love to us, when we respond and give back to God and or then through to his people, we are doing amazing things. In other words, not that it's about us, but that God is working in our lives. The fruit is showing. In other words, that we are taking what we have been given and we understand that it comes from God and then it goes out from us. And the reality is that we look and to see what's taken place. Uh, Paul is well supplied. He's having or having received gifts uh, from Ephroditus. Uh, look at what's taking place. The value also, there's a double thing here. Not only that, that Paul is receiving that, and that he gets something, but he's able to be supported. But take a look at what's also been given. A fragrant offering. Uh, verse 18 it is. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. God knows your heart. God knows what you are doing with the things that you've been given. See, it, it all goes back to, again, if we're learning the idea of contentment. And, and we talk about this in our, in our stewardship time. You know, oftentimes people say, oh, well, the, we're talking about money all the time. No, it's not about money. It's about where your heart is and what you're doing with the things you've been given, whether that is money or time or your talents. In other words, well, time, talent, treasure, those are the, the T's, right, that we have. The idea that we use those things, those gifts that God has given us to continue to work and serve in the kingdom. Remember, that's why we're here. And Paul knows it. He understands. We're go he's going out to go and spread the gospel. This is what he's doing. And he wants people to do the same. But, but it takes effort. It takes sacrifice. And what's going on, what's taking place, is that these people have come through. They supported him when no one else would. And we don't know for sure if it was just money. It, it tends to lend it to that way, that it would sound like that. But also, there are other ways. They can serve, send people. They can send uh, physical supplies like food, clothes, whatever, uh, provide shelter at different times. I mean, they can do different things that help the gospel to continue to go forward. And what happens when that offering is given, that sacrifice is given? It's acceptable to God. It's pleasing because it goes for him. And the benefit is for the kingdom. Someone different someone gets to hear the gospel of jesus christ in other words the good news that jesus died and rose again and it's so exciting to be part of that and so the second question in case you you know again for the answer right how does god reward the generosity um he will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in christ jesus remember god gives us what we actually need Sometimes he gives us our also wants, right? Think about cars. I know that maybe I might want a certain specific type of vehicle, but God says, no, this one will do. Or, you know what, wait on this. I want you to do this so that you have to get a ride from somebody else and you have a conversation and all these, all these things in play. God gives the things that we need at the right time and in the right way according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He's not out there to, to get us. He's not out there to, for us to have a miserable life. But he does want us to remain humble. He does want us to rely on him for everything we need. And that's scriptural. You can find it all over the place. We are to go to God for every single thing that we need because he is the one who provides everything. He's the one who loves us and cares for us all the time. Okay? All right. And so, in closing... Uh, we've got the last verses here, uh, Philippians 4, 21 to 23. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So the natural question is, as Paul closes out this letter to the Philippians, um, a question for you might be today, do you extend God's grace to those around you? Answer that question now by placing or hitting pause 
and then we'll come back and we'll finish up. And welcome back. So that question for you, um, you know, what does it mean maybe to extend God's grace? I don't know. How do you describe it? How do you explain it? See, God's grace is those undeserved things that um, God gives us every single day. It's basically the gift of life. Like, we don't necessarily have a right or an entitlement to, to live. And God gives it, though, to us. He gives us our breath. He gives us our life. He gives us all things, again, in his own time, in his own way. But he lets us have, uh, again, um, life in the kingdom as we serve him. And as you see in Philippians, uh, Paul is finishing out his letter. He's saying to greet everybody in the name of Christ Jesus. Uh, everyone with him was greeting them, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that it was actually Caesar's family, but maybe the servants, maybe those people who took hold of the gospel. And they are giving well wishes. It's almost as you think in a peace um, uh, or a church setting where you, you share the hand of peace. Now, I know we can't do that right now, but um, we still are able to share the love of God with one another. And uh, many of you are gracious and, and do that very well. Um, but that grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. In other words, oh, the peace that comes from knowing that God has this, that God is with us every single day. Um, nothing escapes him, nothing surprises him. He's with us. And, and if you're in a storm right now, uh, you know what? He's going to be with you. He's going to lead you through. He gives us that confidence by the power of the Holy Spirit. Especially what a great weekend as we talk about this on Pentecost, correct? So today, as you go, as we've finished out then today, Philippians chapter 4, these are the things that I want you to think about as you go from this place. Now, I'm already going to tell you, a lot of this can seem very, very law-driven, especially with the answer or the questions that the way that they're asked. But I want you to take a look at these questions today, and I'm just going to go over, I'll give you a, that, that pause at the end, but I'm going to go over some real quick things to think about, and I want them to continue to for you to keep thinking them uh, over and over, okay? So here are the questions. We're going to pause, and then we'll come back. Do members of the church ever disagree with one another? I think you might know the answer already with that, but we'll see. Uh, if so, how should it be handled? There's the first question. The second question, or, sorry, third question, according to the screen, um, it comes back up again. Are you content, or should I maybe say, are you really content? And finally, what is more dangerous to our faith, having too much or too little? Go ahead and place pause, think about those things, and then I'm going to give you some things to, to chew on throughout the rest of the week, okay? Pause now. And welcome back. So uh, I hope that you already answered that yes for the first one. Uh, do members of the church ever disagree with one another? Sure they do. Sure they do. Um, we're human, right? We all have our opinions. We all have our thoughts and processes of things, how they should be. But Paul, again, going back to what scripture says, you know what? Get through the dispute. Work through it. Talk to one another. Use Jesus' example, Matthew, right? Go to one another and work out the disagreement. If not, bring somebody along. Get to the bottom of it. And even, even if you have to disagree or agree to disagree, um, that's one of those things, but but how it should be handled? Work it out. We already have enough trouble as it is with Satan uh, working against us, um, with the outside world uh, not understanding the love of Christ, and yet that's who we're supposed to go to. So so make sure that we're working together with one another as, as brothers, uh, well, brothers with brothers or brothers with sisters or sisters with sisters, okay? So continue to work with one another, uh, trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. That second one, or, or third one, sorry, are you content? Um, that is something that only you can answer. And as I said, a lot of times we do feel guilty when we read stuff like this, when we hear it. But the reality is, is that, you know what? We have a good and loving and gracious God, and he forgives. And so we say, Father, please forgive my selfishness. Please help me be content with what I have. Lord, I think I need so much more, and yet you have given me what I need. Help me to be content. 
Oh, and I'm telling you, as as you know, I'm human too. Uh, I struggle with it every day. And I continue to think, wow, others have these things or others have that. But reality is, is that um, we continue to pray. We continue to hope, again, that God would bring that peace because he should and he, he will. Okay. And then finally, what is more dangerous to our faith, having too much or too little? You know what? I can, I can understand um, you answering either which way on this one. I'm going to say, though, for a majority, a lot of people will say uh, having, having too much is, is really the hard one. And why? Because if we don't have to rely on God, if we have everything that we need, what, what, who, do we need who do we need to work and, and, and look for? Who, who do we need help from? If I've got food every day, if I've got insurance, I've got my home, I've got my car or cars, I've got my, you know, name it, fill in the blank. And yet, God is telling us, don't have any other gods. Don't have anything else that would get in the way of our relationship. He says to us very, very clearly, I'm the one that you should be seeking after. Remember, seek first the kingdom. And then everything else will be added. Everything else will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Follow what God is doing. Follow what he's saying. Jesus loves us. He gave his life for us. And therefore, we have to, again, guard our hearts. Not that, not that we're doing it, but God will do it with us and for us because of the peace that he brings. Aha, I have what I need for today. And that is enough. So let us pray as we close out our time together. Father in heaven, uh, Lord, we thank you for our time that we've been through the book of Philippians. We thank you, Father, that it reminds us of the things that we should be doing and then saying and thinking. And Father, we just ask and pray that you continue to bless us and help us to, uh, again, know that you love us so much and that you care for us greatly. Please forgive us, love us, and help us, that Lord, that we may learn to be more content. And uh, Lord, it's a growing process. Remind us every day. And as we continue to simplify our lives and, and put more focus on you, Lord, um, we'll wonder why on earth we were so selfish to begin with. So we thank you so much, and we thank you for our time. Bless us and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. So we thank you for uh, today, and uh, we look forward to uh, spending more time with you. Uh, so if I understand correctly, hopefully next week we will already start to be in class. We'll see about recording those sessions. I don't know yet. We've got to still figure out what we're all doing. So uh, with that being said, uh, I look forward to um, being with you again, and um, we will let you know what's going on, especially as we continue through this pandemic and all the different things that we need to uh, go through. So God be with you this day and many blessings. Take care. Bye-bye.